Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to the first Fine Biometrics webinar of 2019. The Identity Revolution Comes to Healthcare, presented in association with HIMSS. My name is Peter Counter, and I'm the managing editor of Fine Biometrics and Mobile ID World. Fine Biometrics and Mobile ID World comprise the industry's leading resource for biometrics and mobile digital identity news, interviews, and thought leadership. With nearly two decades of expertise, I'm proud to say our organization covers the industry like no other, with expert featured articles, the most comprehensive biometrics directory on the internet at findbiometricsdirectory.com, live conference coverage from around the globe, like our recent reporting from Mobile World Congress and HIMSS, and of course, our much lauded webinar series, which brings us all together today. Today's webinar will last 45 minutes to an hour, and we'll conclude with an interactive question and answer period, since there are hundreds of attendees registered for today's presentation. Be sure to send your questions as you think of them by typing them into the dialog box on your GoTo control panel during the presentation. Don't wait until the end. So today's webinar is the culmination of Healthcare Biometrics Month a five-week event exploring the role of biometrics in healthcare. For many years now, healthcare has been touted as a major market for biometric adoption, but it's proven resilient to actual deployments, or rather resistant to actual deployments of new identity technologies. And that all seems to be changing with multiple research reports predicting that the global healthcare biometrics market will reach around $14 billion in annual revenue by 2025. And when Fine Biometrics reported live from HIMSS in Orlando uh, earlier in February, the atmosphere around next generation identity technology felt like the mobile space at the start of the often uh, referenced mobile biometrics revolution sparked by Apple's introduction of Touch ID. Uh, it feels like a very long time ago, but that was only, oh, six or, or five years ago. Since the identity revolution in healthcare is just starting out, today we're going to be taking a broad view of major ideas in the healthcare identity space from many different perspectives. And we're lucky to have experts from various identity backgrounds on the webinar to help shed light on the larger healthcare market. But before we start, I want to thank our sponsors for this webinar, BioConnect, HID Global, and Veritad. Now, to kick things off and provide further insight, into the HIMSS conference, as well as growing role of new identity technologies in healthcare, I'm happy to welcome Rod Pajowski, Senior Director of Health Information Systems at HIMSS. Rod, thanks for joining me, and uh, take it away. Thanks, Peter. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, Peter, that'd be great. So um, my intent today is to just give you a high-level overview of HIMSS, if you are not familiar with us, uh, and then uh, an overview of some issues in and around the biometrics area, and then we'll get to the panel discussion. Uh, HIMSS is a global advisor and a thought leader supporting transformation of health through information and technology. But I think the thing that is most uh, graspable is our vision of better health for everyone through information and technology. Uh, Peter showed a photograph earlier taken at our conference, which was uh, just concluded in February in Orlando. Um, we had over 43,000 people there, uh, a great show, lots of uh, new and interesting things. We have about, I think we're over 60,000 members now globally. We continue to grow. Um, we're mostly in North America, but we've been growing a lot in uh, Europe and Asia Pacific and uh, South America as well. So if you're not a member, I invite you to um, check it out. Uh, I think it's a great organization. Um, next slide, please. So real high level, um, you know, the basic triad of authentication factors that we use in uh, identity and authentication in healthcare and elsewhere in the security and identification world is uh, something you know, um, which could be a password, and these are the factors. Something you have, which is a token or a device, as an example, and then something that you are. And 
this continue these are what the biometrics are and this continues to evolve and new technologies are created all the time to identify uh, new ways of doing this but uh, fingerprints is the classic um, which we're all familiar with uh, they can do iris scans voice prints uh, palm vein scanning uh, fingerprint vein scanning and uh, even behavioral uh, biometrics like your keyboard use patterns are actually considered to be a biometric. So when you hear people talking about multi-factor authentication or you see it abbreviated as MFA, this is when we're talking about using two or more of these authentication factors to get a higher level of um, confidence that you've got the right person. Next slide, please. So the the there's been a growing need for biometrics, and I think that's one of the reasons there's a lot of excitement around this field right now. Um, we're collecting more and more information every day uh, about ourselves in the healthcare world, and yet at the same time, the way healthcare is being provided is not always out of a central location. So our lives and our interactions with healthcare are way more distributed than they were, not just physically, but digitally. So in order to identify and authenticate yourself to uh, systems so that you can get the right services and so that you can uh, be, it's a patient safety issue as well, so that um, they know they're working with the right person, biometrics is really coming up as, uh, as, a, as a way to investigate making more advances in this area. One of the background issues here, of course, is that in 1996, HIPAA called for the uh, creation of a universal patient identifier, but there's been a prohibition on developing that UPI for the past 23 years. Um, although now Congress is starting to recognize that um, we really can start to look into this, and HIMSS fully supports that and issued a statement um, to that effect uh, last year. An interesting point here, there was a, just a Wall Street Journal story a couple of weeks ago, and they talked about one organization that has 138,000 cases in which two or more names share the same spelling and the same date of birth. And at this same organization, there are 2,300 or 2,800 people with the exact same name and date of birth. And this is one of the reasons why uh, coming to biometrics and figuring out how to do this is going to be a big uh, benefit for, in the identity world in healthcare. Next slide, please, Peter. A uh, couple of the things that need to be overcome. Yes, this is all still uh, in some ways quite nascent and still in development, but the verification uh, for, of your identity is becoming more digital versus in person. In the days when you would always go face to face to get services, um, you know, your ID might be sufficient. But now with people getting healthcare services in the home and through telemedicine and things like that, we have to figure out how to do this in a more digital and blended environment. And technology is making these kinds of advances possible. Um, one thing that uh, we need to overcome is patients and providers must be willing to implement these types of technologies. Um, one of the drivers here is that with the growth of the patient-generated health data, um, providers need, are increasingly asking themselves, what's the liability here and the risk of not reviewing this information and data that comes in? And they still need to know, is it the right patient? Is the data good? Um, the other thing that's helping drive this a little bit is uh, these types of devices are more and more common. We all have fingerprint readers on our phones now and computers come with a lot of these uh, biometric capable devices built in. It's not foolproof and uh, it's best when combined with other factors, again, multi-factor authentication, but this really gets you a lot further. We need to figure out um, still what kind of standards are going to be used and what kind of infrastructure if we hope to grow the use of this beyond just within an organization, but between organizations. And that's the umbrella uh, discussion for today, and I'm going to turn it back over to Peter so we can start uh, with the actual panel. And thank you, everybody. Thanks very much, Rod. That was a fantastic overview of, of what we see going on in healthcare as well. Um, it's really fascinating, I think, to to see those numbers about the um, the duplicate biographic data, and it's not even an error. It really goes to show how much we do need this factor of who 
somebody actually is what they actually are. So I'm sure we'll be touching back a lot on that uh, information. Moving forward though, I am very excited to introduce our expert panel. We have Rob Douglas, CEO and Chairman of BioConnect, John E. Ahrens, CEO of Veritad, and Brett Lanou, Senior Sales Executive of Crossmatch, an HID global company. And of course, Rod will be joining us on this panel as well. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me here today, and I'm excited to jump into this. So let's uh, start out with something that I was just sort of touching on there. Uh, we'll talk about use cases. So my first question here, what are the use cases you are seeing for biometrics and identity verification in the healthcare industry today? And what technologies are actually allowing identity, next generation identity to finally enter the healthcare industry in a tangible way? And uh, can I start with uh, Rob, please, Rob Douglas? Uh, yes, uh, good morning or good afternoon to those um, um, joining in today. So in terms of use cases, um, I'm a student of the biometric industry. I, I'm only, I only have now 15 years of experience, but I, it's fascinating to watch how different markets adopt and consume the technology. And we fundamentally believe that the healthcare industry is now at the beginning phases of the consumption of biometrics as part of the multi-factor authentication. So what's the use cases are, the first one is cyber attacks. So Unfortunately, this is uh, an issue that we're all uh, dealing with and the healthcare uh, market is no exception to that. So any use case of anyone who's using an ID and password today needs to find a path to replace that with a much higher level of authentication in order to prevent cyber attacks. So that use case really fundamentally means all applications are now at risk and need a solution. And so in the world of multi-factor authentication, using biometric information as part of that authenticator is, uh, is, a, is a game changer in terms of reducing the cyber threat that exists. A second use case would be, um, some of my colleagues have been uh, speaking about this idea of you know, healthcare at the edge. And so in a world where you're doing e-prescriptions, where you're getting e-health delivery to you at your home or remote of a bricks and mortar uh, healthcare uh, practitioner, the need for identity confirmation and authentication becomes critical for all aspects of, um, of healthcare. So think if we can imagine all applications of healthcare that have moved from bricks and mortar to a digital answer where people are now remote, it's really paramount now at this point where, where you need to be able to do that. And the second, um, the second comment that you asked about was just the technology itself is the, you know, Apple did us the most gracious service by bringing uh, fingerprint recognition to the mobile device now five years ago. And we in the industry all, all looked and said, we're finally gonna get to ubiquity. And ubiquity is required in order for consumption to occur. And so technologically, we've now got to ubiquity. So that's a great thing. But what's missing is a platform or platforms. And there's a requirement for, if you can imagine, software platforms that can curate all kinds of biometric information and uniquely tie that to an individual or to a patient and then make that available to the, uh, the applications that exist in, um, in the healthcare industry. So, you know, my wish for the industry is that anyone who's building applications um, for the healthcare uh, delivery system is upgrading to multi-factor authentication. They're looking for a platform that consumes these biometrics and plugs them into their applications. And I think when that moment's happened, then we all can declare victory that We've got higher, much higher level of trust in the system. Fantastic. Yeah, I agree. It's it's it really feels like it's all all about to happen. Brett, can I get you to uh, weigh in on this question, please, from your perspective? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So so kind of pivoting off um, of the background, the original use cases in, in looking at the healthcare in general. Um, you know, our perspective in, 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 in being, being the preeminent um, player in biometrics for so long, fortunately, we're in a position, I think, uh, where you can see where the adoption of biometrics uh, was driven at a critical need around pharmacy cabinets, even going back to, say, 2002, 2003. Um, those devices were not connected. Uh, and to the point where things need to live on the edge. Uh, I think the central management and controls that are coming into scope today and being driven by authentication partners out there 
uh, are making that a lot easier uh, from an interoperability and plug and play standpoint. So uh, seeing this on the biometric side, the pharmacy level, uh, the use of it, especially the, the, the critical need around preventing authorized access and, and the, the, the uh, effect on drug diversion, uh, the impact it's having right now, I think are critical. Um, you know, biometrics provides, as you know, that irrefutable um, identity or piece of information that, that provides accountability around it and something that's critically uh, needed to be built out uh, from the inside out of the infrastructure. So um, taking into consideration the strategy around this, folks need to look from the inside out and build it from the core. Um, one of the, the pieces today that, uh, and pivoting off the, the, the HIMSS presentation and the reference around uh, MFA, uh, multi-factor authentication, compliance has been critical. Uh, since 96, a reference going back to, you know, the, the, the startup of HIPAA and a lot of the focus, uh, much of the attention has been around passwords. How do we mitigate? How do we manage these things? Uh, fingerprint biometrics is obviously one of those technical uh, entry points for us, at least to come in at a, at a, a level of associating uh, positive identification of a user to access, you know, mission critical environments, EHR records, uh, dispensing meds, things like that. Uh, where it is today, uh, it's expanded. Uh, it's, it's a critical epidemic. Look at the opioid uh, epidemic across the country now and, and trying to manage that. Uh, biometrics are playing a critical piece, especially around two-factor authentication, where you need to positively identify that prescriber. And then ultimately downstream, you're using it to fulfill, verif you know, verify fulfillment of, 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 of meds, as well as even patient identification. So uh, it's the whole continuum that, that biometrics are in, and I think we're in a very fortunate position today because uh, the majority of the EHR vendors, the authentication technology platforms, and the, the uh, prescription folks have already kind of figured this out, and so I think it's just a matter of executing in a lot of cases. Fantastic, yeah. And uh, John, I would be curious to hear your perspective on this coming from an identity verification standpoint. Um, yeah, no, I, I uh, certainly appreciate that. And thanks, Peter, for having us today. Um, yeah, we do come at this from a bit of a different angle. In as uh, Veritat is a, a global provider of identity verification, age verification. Um, we do knowledge-based authentication solutions and two-factor authentication solutions for really any business that uh, conducts business on the internet or needs to verify an individual's age or identity. And so, um, yeah, we, we're seeing the, uh, I think we're going to piggyback on the previous speakers here, but, you know, we're seeing a, um, uh, a group of use cases in healthcare specifically, uh, like patient portals and online pharmacy um, practice management software systems that are out there, telemedicine, um, using our solutions as a sort of a product mix of the identity data um, the two-factor authentication, the biometric piece associated with that, perhaps the document validation uh, for onboarding patient uh, patients or doctors, um, or revenue cycle management for HIPAA compliance, uh, patient privacy and security. Uh, those are the kinds of things that uh, that we're seeing as the use cases. And then, you know, just in terms of the enabling factors, um, we see a few that are converging. Uh, in addition to the ongoing maturity of the identity technologies themselves. I mean, the first factor that we're seeing is sort of a heightened general awareness, you know, all the media attention and the everyday conversation at consumer level around the importance of data privacy and data security. And so with that growing consumer awareness, I mean, there'll be naturally a growing consumer demand that is going to push on these healthcare providers to do more to demonstrate to the patients that, you know, their personal health data is in good hands. and. Um, and I believe that the healthcare providers are going to want to respond to differentiate themselves competitively in that regard. Um, there'll be a number of important things these providers will want to do to establish consumer confidence, not the least of which will be to adopt an effective digital identity technology strategy as part of that effort. And so, um, yeah, we're seeing a growing number of healthcare delivery options uh, that are facilitated uh, by the use of um, new online technologies like bots and virtual care. And in order for any of these new methods of delivery to be considered safe and effective, and you know, all the stakeholders are going to want assurances that identity is managed accurately and safely. Um, the other factor that comes to my mind is that yeah, the healthcare industry, including the providers and the payers and you know all the consumers, I mean, 
they're dealing with this ongoing costly issue of a medical identity theft, uh, the duplicate records issue that got mentioned earlier, uh, payment fraud, all that uh, can be mitigated by an effective digital identity strategy. So I think when you combine the increased consumer demand with a rising number of all these new healthcare technologies that will increase patient engagement, um, and then you add on the ongoing need to address the issues of medical ID theft and duplicate records and payment fraud, I mean, the identity industry, uh, and I know we're we're in this uh, in this group. We have a significant incentive to innovate new identity technologies, and of course, the providers will be compelled to discover you know, new identity technologies and deploy them in a tangible way. Absolutely. Um, I just want to jump off of something that uh, Brett mentioned. Brett, you mentioned the opioid crisis, and I'm just fascinated in how that can sort of dovetail into this conversation, you know, secure and accountable patient ID, it's important from a clinical access control standpoint, but a major contribution to healthcare fraud in the U.S., which is contributing to the opi opioid crisis, is doctor shopping and prescription abuse. And so the question I have for the whole panel, but we'll start with you, Brett, is can secure and verified patient ID prevent patients from committing fraud at a pharmacy? Yeah, so no, thank you very much. So, so in, in, in looking at the, the, the patient identification side and kind of working it backward, uh, one of the things uh, that have, we've seen success both in um, working relationships between certain vendors and state-led uh, initiatives, even driving initiatives or uh, certifications at the state level, have been driven at the patient identification level where the ability to identify a patient coming into an intake clinic, uh, positively identify them and tie them uh, to their records, uh, even including a duplication of records, appropriate caregiver access, things like that have led to a huge reduction in drug diversion and the ability for these, these uh, patients to actually go ahead and, and, and doctor shop around. Also tying into this are the drug monitoring programs that are being led at the state level, uh, of course, uh, pharmacists or providers need to take an active role up front to, to use them accordingly and making sure they're getting alerts in a timely manner. But all of these collectively uh, help reduce the drug diversion and uh, address the fraud uh, at the intake centers where you're gonna see a more majority of this taking place. Right, yeah, and uh, Rob, what do you have to say about this? Um, I actually nothing further. I think uh, Brett described it well. I mean, there's um, no question that by doing this, we can reduce uh, both you know human fraud as well as cyber related fraud. And John, do you have anything to add? Um, well, you know, agreeing with uh, both Rob and Brett uh, that um, you know there's a there's an effective way forward here for you know for this to have a, an impact. I mean, it, it's a bit of a tricky question to answer because in terms of Mitigating exposure to doctor shopping and uh, the pharmacy fraud, um, you know, just using the better patient ID. I think, you know, there are a number of factors that will be in play there. I mean, when someone's willing to use a good identity at numerous pharmacies with a Ford script or, uh, you know, the doctors and the pharmacists are in on the fraud, of course, the answer is perhaps a bit more of a no. However, you know, if the attempted fraud is patient driven, the answer could be more of a yes. And so, I mean, for us to answer that question, we, we're looking at it from the standpoint of separating these into two sort of categories. One is the physical patient visit to the pharmacy um, and the other is the online space. So um, we do more serve at the online uh, environment, but we're seeing more of uh, inquiry on our side to provide services at a point of sale or a point of service. And at the counter, you know, the brick and mortar chain pharmacies and other local pharmacies are, you know, they're doing what's been done for many years. And that's asking for demographic data, like a name and a date of birth and you want to confirm the identity of the pickup. You might get those questions. And then in some cases, by taking a physical government identity document, like in essence, carding the patient. Um, I was recently reading an article actually in Drugstore News that was calling for like just a step up for pharmacies. Like, hey, let's like deploy a local technology that could validate the identity documents without relying on staff at the counter to decision a document for identity. 
Um, now, for online, for the e-prescriptions, where the scripts are phoned in by physician, you know, absolutely the, you know, uh, the e-prescribed online thing is, um, you know, both the doctor prescriber and the patient level where we see verified identity playing an important role uh, to prevent fraud and, re you know, reduce access to these, you know, these um, controlled substances. But two-factor authentication, vital tool, we also see that with the e-prescriptions that they're coming from a trusted physician prescriber identity. And of course, as I mentioned, the patient access online is another place of identity technology insertion. So yes, uh, we do see a uh, secure and verified patient ID playing a role in preventing patients from committing fraud at the pharmacy, for sure. Fascinating. And uh, Rod, I would be uh, interested to hear your thoughts on on this larger take, just from the the HIMSS perspective of the larger industry. Do you have anything to add? Sure. Uh, I think they covered it really well, but as I was listening to this, I was thinking about the broad scope of impact that this particular case they're talking about has. Uh, it ranges from individual physician risk uh, management to the patient to the organization. There's fraud management and savings, and this and this expands out all the way to population health. And that's just this one case. So that just struck me as very wide ranging and 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 with lots of potential. Absolutely. And now talking about that, I think that it sort of brought up this larger idea. Uh, on a on a broader scale, about some of the challenges in it, adopting biometrics and ID verification for healthcare applications, and uh, I'm wondering what are some of the challenges still facing the industry right now in this space. Uh, John, can we get you to start off on this one, please? Well, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think you know the the challenges are um, you know they're mostly around the privacy. I think. Um, and some of them are around cost um, and um, finding a balance. Um, you know, the balance between you know uh, the privacy and adoption and cost. I think um, interoperability has been also a challenge that we hear quite a bit about. That also uh, comes into play. Um, and I think the challenges are similar here than you'd find in some of the other markets that we serve. Um, and um, Although I do believe there's uh, a significant, uh, significantly greater, um, uh, you know, sort of exposure. Obviously, when you're talking about some life and death issues, perhaps with making sure you've got the right patient, um, that's driving us, you know, toward wanting to find good solutions for this. But I think the challenges that just come to my mind are the the privacy and the adoption. You know, folks who are uh, I know myself. If I'm you know. <laughs> If I'm being checked in for any kind of a medical service and people would like my my face and they would like my fingerprints and my palm scan and my <laughs> I'm a little bit resistant to that, you know, it's an adoption issue. And I think people are concerned about that. And I think also the cost um, uh, to balance, get a good balance of those is what I think is uh, is part of the challenge. Right. And uh, Rob, can I get you to to add on to that from the biometrics perspective? Yes, it's my pleasure. Um, one of the things that I watch everybody do is they think that taking the biometrics that are built into the mobile device and doing an integration to that is the answer. And um, what people don't realize until they've done it is that has done nothing towards reducing fraud or improving identity. Those biometrics that are pre-built into the devices are nothing more than a convenient way to overlay on top of a password for an individual human. There's no binding between the biometric information and the healthcare practitioner or whoever's actually providing that application. So the first, um, there's sort of a rush to, oh, wait, I've got these biometrics on my phone. Why don't I use that? And so, and then the next thing I observe is that people then look to try to do what's called a point-to-point -point integration. They find their favorite biometric, and now they want to plug that right into an application they have. And, you know, I just watched it. Uh, year after year, it, it's not a um, it's not a scalable model. Uh, the biometric world and, and technologies are constantly evolving. You know, just think of like five years ago. You know, finger recognition was the thing, and now today it's all about face recognition. And tomorrow it will be something else. And so the answer to that is uh, there is a really technological inhibitor here, which is that you've got to take a you've got to um, You've got to have a platform that allows you to be agnostic to all the change that goes on in the biometric world and yet continues to bind the patient or the user 
to the applications that they're operating in. And so I, I have watched that to be a technological uh, constraint. Certainly, as John just mentioned, you know, privacy is one that everybody is concerned about, which really leads to knowledge. I think once people understand how these biometric systems work, their, uh, their fear actually drops off significantly. Because when you separate your PII from the biometric template, there's no benefit in the template. Like the template is just a bunch of zeros and ones sitting in an encrypted um, module. And there's nothing that is really a view that's actually um, usable by others. So I think privacy is one. I think just technological understanding of approach and how to do it would be a second one. And I think he's right, uh, John's right also that there is a cost element to this. Uh, but I fundamentally believe if you could imagine a world where all delivery services of healthcare now had accountability of identity in every transaction. Just think of the amount of money that we would actually be able to save in the healthcare system that's sitting in there because there's not accountability today. Absolutely. It actually reminds me of a previous conversation you and I have had, Rob, about uh, infrastructural challenges for identity and sort of a larger uh, a larger idea of what identity means in society, even beyond healthcare. Um, so it really does feel like there are there is a lot to be built upon. Brad, could, uh, could make, oh, yeah, just make one more comment. <laughs> of course. You know, when we all when we're all born, um, you know, we begin the journey of identity by receiving our birth certificate, which is a piece of plastic issued by the government. And then we spend the rest of our lives just continuously receiving more and more plastic or um, key fobs or passwords, which are approximations of who we are and they never will be us. But the truth is that we're so used to it that we don't even think anything different of it. Like it's, you know, it's just normal. I'm supposed to be walking around with this piece of plastic of identity or I'm supposed to walk around with a password. So there's, there's, a, um, there's a maturing of all of us that needs to see that in fact, you know, that world is over. And, um, we have to get to a better place in terms of uh, real confirmation of identity to drive you know, cost out of the healthcare delivery system. Absolutely. And uh, Brett, are there any uh, additional challenges you'd like to speak to? Yeah, actually, you know, Rob did a, a really nice job of summing that up. So one, one of the things, you know, even going back off of what John had mentioned earlier as well, um, the awareness or just a general acceptance around biometrics came around, you know, when Apple put that fingerprint reader on that, that mobile unit or device, um, the world changed. And you can look at that as being some of the initial uh, steps uh, towards the biometric revolution because it is about awareness and acceptance and it has to happen at the consumer level, uh, at a broad based uh, level. And I think that those users, when they go to work, um, they do. They, they think about that, uh, the CISOs, the, the CMIOs, they, they think, how can I use this in my daily life? And where it is today, um, you know, we're accessing applications and services via your fingerprint or, or face or, or however other combinations of multi-factor, and it's pretty much frictionless to a point. Uh, those things are available um, in healthcare uh, and other areas today. And, and what's nice about it is taking that from a consumer standpoint uh, and providing some kind of of uh, governance around it or direction from a control where organizations can now centrally enroll, store, secure, and manage all this information and then allow users based on policies or permission levels to, to, to you know, access a door, access their phone or their, their general nursing shared station, whatever it might be, uh, you have that biometric or that, that seamless integration from the day you wake up to the end of the day, you know, biometrics are, are playing a part in it or a level of biometrics are being used to make it, you know, make it better. So, um, you know, it's, it's really there. And in the interconnected the connected world today too, you can buy a device or there's an option for, for biometrics and practically anything these days, or it's, it's, it's right around the corner. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty special time. And I think you're gonna see the explosion happen uh, literally in the next 24 to 36 months, uh, especially with, with certain mandates or unified strategies, you know, taken hold. So uh, I'm looking, I'm excited about it. It really is exciting. And, you know, we're, we keep coming back to this other revolution that's happening in healthcare, which is mobility. And part of that is an emerging home care market, a remote care market. And uh, I would love to hear your opinion on how biometrics and identity verification 
fit into this emer emerging home care market. Uh, Brett, can we we'll we'll stick with you on this one and then and then cycle through. Yeah, so, so you know, our, our direct uh, kind of practical approach to this or experience that we've seen um, a lot of success in has been around the uh, visiting nurse associations, remote caregivers going out. Um, and and uh, one of the challenges were around initially time and attendance payroll. You know, how do I identify, how does this nurse go out and how do I know that she performed uh, access to system First of all, secure access to PHI, secure access to that system remotely, uh, but then tying it into patient identification and being able to access the right records, uh, dispense the right meds, uh, prescribe the right treatment, um, it's, it's all evolving in that direction. So uh, it started as a baseline uh, initially around more of uh, payroll and, and, uh, and working towards securing access to the EHR and PHI. Um, but seeing where it's going now with all these various different uh, connected devices, uh, even monitoring the level of service or progress that patients are making from a remote location or session um, are incredible. And so, um, you know, the frauds reintroduced, you're seeing it very similar to a patient ID at, a, at an intake center um, to be able to patient. Those services are now extending out and available to those home environments. And uh, it, it, it definitely is making it better for the patient quality of service and and ultimately it does tie right into your bottom line from a revenue cycle as well fantastic yes and uh and john what would you have to add about home care well gee after brett summed it up that well uh that was uh i think very well said um yeah in terms of this home care you know context uh physical visits by home care professionals delivering services um yeah, we see this as a place where identity and trust is a most critical factor, right? I mean, first, the outside caregiver, um, you know, they're going to have access to patient information and will need to be trusted by the patient as well as the agency they represent, as Brett pointed out. Um, from the patient point of view, you know, is the caregiver identity verified? Are they who they say they are when they arrive at the home? So from the caregiver point of view, they need to be sure they have the right patient to assure the safety and security of the patient during the visit. Um, in the context of services which are consumed by the patient from outside those bricks and mortars, um, uh, where you know at a hospital and otherwise, like you know whether at home or in an alternate location, the trust factors are important to consider. So, I mean, we see mobile apps and the mobile device and uh, the Internet of Things or Internet of Medical Things playing a very significant role in the delivery of this kind of care and in that environment, the mobile device and the apps will be a big factor in how identity and trust are established. Um, whether it's physically delivered at home or online, I think that's going to be the case. And uh, apps that are equipped with inclusion of the biometrics or the two-factor authentication, um, mobile device verification, by the way, uh, a big factor uh, for us we're seeing as a great layer of security where we're actually getting mobile carrier data about each device um, so that we can put another layer of security outside the identity of just the demographic information. Um, GPS location verification uh, could be extremely useful in establishing, you know, that trust for, you know, for home care delivery of service. So, um, yeah, I see there's, there's a significant role for uh, the biometrics and identity uh, in the home care market for sure. Fantastic. We're getting a ton of uh, questions in from the audience. There are a lot on uh, one specific topic that I'd actually like to throw out to Rob Douglas first. Um, are there, I'm just going to try and, and sum this up, are there uh, parallels or, or uh, similarities between the healthcare biometrics market and the enterprise biometrics market? Uh, I would say the answer is yes, and the parallel is the where the enterprise is providing applications or services to their customers or to their consumers. And so in that use case of the enterprise, it's very similar. So I could be a healthcare enterprise performing that, or I could be a non-healthcare enterprise, but I think that, that those use cases are very similar, and the way you would apply the technology is very similar. 
So I, that's the, how I would see the connection to it. And if, if you don't mind, I would like to add just one other comment because I'm actually standing up because I really wanted to make a comment about that last use case. Oh, absolutely, yeah, jump in. <laughs> the thing that I love about the use case of the home healthcare um, you know, um, idea or use case is it generates revenue. So we all think of biometrics as, okay, it's going to reduce cyber attack, it's going to improve trust of uh, transaction, it's going to improve compliance. But that use case drives revenue growth because you need the assurance of identity in order to complete those um, those services out in uh, in the uh, in home healthcare delivery. So that is it's just a, it's a neat thing to be able to see that in that type of use case, of which there's many of them, biometrics are actually an enabler to allow an organization to accelerate their the revenue growth. Absolutely. Thanks for jumping back in on that. And, you know, it is such an uh, interesting topic. Rod, I would be interested to hear about the home care market from your perspective. Yeah, I think uh, it's all been pretty well covered so far. Uh, as I was listening to this, I'm thinking the word that has been mentioned a couple of times is trust. Um, I, I with the growth of the home care market, all of the different devices that are out there, um, I think it was um, Rob that mentioned binding the biometric, uh, you know, to the record back at the provider. But that happens via the device, and and so swinging back into this word of trust and the 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 use case for home care and people's acceptance of this and their sense of what's going on. Um, we really need to ensure that um, there's tr some transparency uh, and accountability in the device market. Um, the, and I think that will go a long way toward acceptance of, of these types of technologies. As long as we continue to read stories about, oh, did you know that app that you downloaded to play a game was actually harvesting all of your contacts and sending them here and there? You know, as long as we keep hearing about that kind of stuff, uh, it's going to make the job of people trying to do the right thing through biometrics. And, uh, you know, I think all of us who work in healthcare are trying to do the right thing. I'll make that blanket statement. Uh, it's going to hinder um, progress. So I think that the trust issue uh, is a really huge one here. And, uh, and, and there's an opportunity there to, to, to demonstrate that, that this trust chain uh, can be built and, uh, and trusted. We well, you know that's that's really uh, a fascinating thread to pull out here. We, it fits in really well with an audience question I have uh, that I'm just going to open up to the floor, uh, and it is centered around trust. The question is: In healthcare, what is the more relevant issue to authenticate patients or the service providers? And I'll just leave that open to anybody who wants to answer. Yeah, this is this is Brett from Crossmatch. Um, you know, it's, they're both critical uh, and important. Um, I think given where healthcare is today, um, the provider uh, being part of an organized health system and with initiatives and certifications and mandates being driven, uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's an area that is easier to address um, in the short term uh, where you can secure the provider, um, centrally enroll them, everything supervised, audited, regulated. Uh, so you have a lot of the uh, pieces there to drive it forward. Uh, and, and inevitably, like EPCS, you've got the, the mandate in 2021 coming forward from the federal side that's really going to solidify everything on the provider side, uh, whether it's the, the organization itself, the provider office, down to the pharmacy. Um, now, on the, the patient side, I can see where if we can drive, uh, and there have been successful adoption with certain coalitions and, and state-led efforts uh, on, on having you know, 50 million users enrolled uh, and with a 95% uh, success rate that, that the patients want to enroll a biometric. So that's huge from a mindshare standpoint uh, and a general trust factor. So uh, I think it's there, but we, we need that unified drive and, and have a, a little bit more uh, adoption at the state level uh, with the help of the federal uh, guidance as well. 
And uh, but the unification, I think, is going to be a big piece of driving on the patient side. And uh, it's it's very near um, maturity or ready to go forward on the on the on the provider side. Right. Would anybody else like to jump in on that? All right. Uh, well, moving on, we are quickly running out of time here, and uh, I just want to end this conversation on something really tangible in terms of the identity revolution that's coming to healthcare. You know, while there is a massive opportunity for biometrics and identity verification in this market, you know, we've been talking about all of this potential, but it is still nascent. It's in its early days. And I think it would be great to end this conversation on some concrete, tangible next steps that need to be taken for biometrics and strong identity to really revolutionize healthcare. And uh, let's start with John on this one, please. Okay, sure. Well, uh, that's a really big question. Um, and I'm uh, not sure there's any easy or comprehensive answer to the question. I, I could give you some thoughts here. My first thought is that any opportunity to revolutionize healthcare is going to likely be in steps, as your question implies, rather than one significant development. I mean, to take next steps, um, perhaps we just take a moment, um, step back and consider the current landscape, right, of identity technologies that are used in other enterprise environments. And we spoke about this earlier, about the connection perhaps between the two. Um, and then look at what might stand in the way of the healthcare industry, you know, experiencing some sort of a breakthrough on this, on this topic. I mean, in the current landscape, uh, for all the other enterprise environments, you know, we're basically relying on the use of a few trusted methodologies that include some of those that were mentioned earlier by, by Rod, like something you know, the something you have, and the something you are. Um, and we're using trusted third-party identity data and the validation of government identity documents for tasks like onboarding or for ongoing access from patients or consumers. We rely on a registered individual that we already trust using an assigned biometric token or perhaps two-factor. Um, so in all these other enterprise environments, you know, there's a general agreement that these are effective and they're important to deploy. And, you know, uh, some like in financial services are mandated by a regulation like a KYC or an AML check. Um, not as a silver bullet, but as layers of security using the best we have to assure the identity and security. And while these all these current technologies can be effective, the healthcare industry uh, seems to still be wrestling with uh, other competing, I guess, call them political or compliance standards, uh, business factors around patient data and its use that need resolution as part of you know, any formulation as to a concrete next step toward an effective identity technology that could be transformative. So it's not just about available technologies, it's also about the industry agreement on standards and the resolve to move forward in a deployment. Um, maybe one concrete step would be, you know, while we're waiting to see how all this shakes out in the industry, um, you know, and uh, maybe it's to say, like, maybe we need the software vendors and uh, the stakeholders to make identity a priority simply by just stepping up the current use. I mean, the use of current technologies. In other words, um, let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, do more with what we have, perhaps. Um, it did sound hopeful that the industry was on its way to resolving some of these. I know at the HIMSS conference, we heard the CMS administrator you know, speak to this, uh, that the idea about patient data, uh, you know, belonging to the patient, and uh, they were looking for ways to put the weight of, uh, of CMS, you know, sort of behind the, uh, you know, how they could put them behind patient identification and patient matching as a priority. So the next step, um, the next step seem, would seem to me like we've got great current uh, technologies, and it's a matter of resolve, perhaps, and uh, and getting the industry organized. Absolutely, uh, Rob Douglas. I'd like to hear your concrete next steps. What do you okay. think? Um, I think it's. Um, I, I was listening to um, what John was just saying, and I, I think it's the nexus of three things. It's um, it's compliance. Uh, the further need around compliance is going to drive um, uh, the requirement to execute. It's the second is standards. Uh, one of the things that I really like actually is the Drug Enforcement Administration. So the DAE has published 
uh, level three assurance and identity standards. And included in that is the use of biometrics. So from a, from a uh, standards perspective and a compliance perspective, I see evidence within the healthcare market that are getting their arms around this and are publishing what these standards are. So I see that as a sign that tells me that it's coming. And then the third is a successful deployment of somewhere between a million to 10 million users of a healthcare application of any form will draw attention to the whole industry to go, you know, look, it can be done. So we just need to now show evidence of it happening. And this historically has happened. It happened in the law enforcement uh, sector decades ago. It happened in border crossings, uh, you know, 15 years ago. It's happened in the um, in the financial service industry where you saw larger deployments occurring. So what the what the um, what the um, healthcare sector needs to see now is uh, an example of uh, fairly. I'm not. It doesn't have to be a huge deployment. But I'm going to say one to. 10 million users deployed in a biometric authentication world. And that just gives the evidence that everybody else can uh, can follow. And that'll be the tipping point. That's when I think we'll see the tip uh, occur in, in the market. Absolutely. And I think you hit on something really key there as well as just this idea that it's been done before and there are examples of how this can happen. Brett, what would you say are concrete next steps? Yeah, I think they, they, they rounded it off pretty well. It's, I'm looking. I'm looking at it. Um, you know, what what can what can healthcare proactively do right now? And 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 given the experience that's out there and the various use cases, um, you know, John and Rob mentioned uh, other um, markets. You know, CGIS was a huge driver for advanced authentication and, and and a great validation point for biometrics around law enforcement, water crossings. Um, you look at, you know. Um, millions and, and you know billions of users in India, you know, uh, with an identity program like that uh, for um, tracking, um, you know, entitlements and distribution, things like that, uh, eliminating fraud there. Uh, just the overall ability to identify a user uh, for financial inclusion. These things have been done uh, stateside, uh, drawing correlations to it here. Uh, we're looking at. You know, a lot and until you have the standard um, ran across the government driving it down, like we're seeing with these individual mandates around EPCS, uh, the individual hospitals, I think a concrete step would be um, do an assessment, um, be more, uh, define some kind of plan of action, uh, enlist your users, uh, drop in small little test uh, areas into EDs or or ambulatory surgery units where you, you can get an immediate idea of what the reception or the general acceptance is gonna be, and then gain that confidence. And that's more for, more for organizations that haven't been exposed to you know, the major EHRs or, or single sign-on solutions and things that are already out there today. So um, I, guess, I guess in a nutshell, engage a trusted advisor who has visibility into all these areas and map it out and assess it against your current environment and user population and architecture and and, and put some timeline to it and see really what the overall uh, effort's gonna be. Because I, I think they're gonna be surprised at the end of the day that um, you know you have institutions that are implementing things around EPCS in, in, in a month as opposed to what it took a year you know, to do 10 years ago. So uh, it's come a long way. Absolutely. And to just for one last twist on this before I, I hand it over to, to Rod. Rod, what would you like to see from the identity industries in the coming years? In this what would I like to see? You can, you you can like I'll, be, see? I'll be listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm keen so, um, uh, here, here's in, in thinking about concrete steps. I, I'm thinking systemically, and and I I agree with what everyone has said, and I think what Brett said um, is is a nice kind of summary of where I was going. But I'm thinking systemically, not just, uh, and, and I'm not even suggesting that Brett was limited to individual organizations, but. Um, I think, first of all, we need to realize, and many of us in technology do, that implementing new technologies is um, not all about the technology implementation. A lot of times, the majority of the lift is around the cultural change required. That's the bulk of our discussion today. The technologies are there, but we're talking about how to gain trust and how to get people aware of this. 
I think number two, we need, the, the non-European Union world needs to imagine a future in which GDPR is real and affects everyone globally. Um, I, I, if, and, and, and then from there, I think what we need to do, what I'd like to see is maybe some stakeholder collaboration in which uh, you work together to articulate the future, the ideal future of the use of these technologies and show how it works and, and tell people how they're going to be protected and then articulate the benefits as well. And then we can all build toward that vision. But I think it's really important to include this GDPR as a factor in the future that we envision with this because it will have an effect, even though it's not um, part of laws uh, in the U.S. or elsewhere just yet, it is already affecting our work and it could very well become a global standard and we need to account for that as we uh, articulate that vision. All right. Well, I think that that's a great note to end on here. Thank you, Rod, Brett, Rob, and John for this really thoughtful conversation. I had a great time. I hope you did too. I'm sure our audience did. Thank you again to our sponsors, BioConnect, HID Global and Veritad. And of course, thank you to HIMSS, our premier partner in the healthcare space. Be sure to visit findbiometrics.com and mobileidworld.com for information on our upcoming webinars, thought leadership, featured articles, breaking news, and our upcoming live event coverage of ISC West in April. Thank you everyone for attending. This concludes the webinar presentation.